everyone, and welcome back. Though Edna Mode quite famously declared, no capes, I am not a superhero. At best, I'm a supervillain, and really more likely I'm just very dramatic. So I feel like capes perhaps are the answer, especially as we come into this time of the year, not only for Halloween, but also for cooler weather. And in reality, it's been one of, if not the most popular garments throughout history. And though we do tend to call it a cape today, and that is the terminology that we've had for decades at this point, in fact, historically, these were cloaks. And a cape, though it did exist, was actually this little piece that sat on top of and around the shoulders. So you could have a cloak with a cape, you could have a coat with a cape, or multiple capes. There are also all sorts of variations on this style of garment in terms of capelets, mantles, mantelettes, just a whole huge range, especially as we reach the 19th and 20th centuries, of different styles of outerwear that are loose, voluminous, and quite frankly, incredibly functional. And that is at the core of why the cloak or the cape is really such a popular garment throughout all of history and all over the world. In its simplest form, we're talking about outerwear that is not fitted or shaped to the body, so it is incredibly simple and easy to make. Usually it's circular in shape or perhaps square or rectangular, it could be triangular, anything that is unfitted drapes over the shoulders and in all honesty usually will keep you drier and warmer than most fitted outer garments will. So it's no wonder that this general style has survived for thousands and thousands of years as one of the most popular garments. In reality today though, it's not seen very much. I know every once in a while we hear a rumbling of bringing capes back and I do support this thoroughly. I think it is both an incredibly functional and very dramatic garment, and it seemed only perfect that I would be making one for my upcoming trip, dealing with colder weather over in the UK and New York in October. I needed something to go over all of my nice suits without having to worry about what would fit inside of it, sleeve shape-wise or whatever else, but it would keep them dry if it's raining, because I don't want to get my tailor pieces wet, and would generally keep me warmer without creating a huge amount of heavy bulk and weight to pack in my suitcase. So the cape seemed like really the best option. Now I'm not going to be making just a really simple, basic cloak or cape. If you want to see how to do that, I highly recommend heading on over to Burnley and Trowbridge. They are actually doing a sew along in the month of October for making a really standard cloak style that's appropriate not only for the 18th century, but quite frankly, can extend pretty far on either side of that. So if you want the most quintessential of cloaks, head on over that way. I also highly recommend if you are looking for a really wonderful wool or other fabric for your cloak to also check out the fabrics that they have. They are usually my go-to for wools and that is where the wool for my cape today is coming from as well. And if we're already on the topic of really good quality textiles, I think it's the perfect time for me to mention that the sponsor of the video this week is Brooklinen. Brooklinen is my favorite source for bed sheets, towels, and all sorts of other home textiles. They have amazingly high quality without the really high prices. They produce their bed sheets themselves and sell them directly to you. And right now they are offering my viewers a special discount of $20 off any order over $100 if you just click the link below and use the code Rudolph. We spend a third of our lives in bed, so you deserve a really great set of bed sheets. And I have absolutely fallen in love with linen. It keeps you cool and dry. They are such soft sheets and they have this wonderful cozy feeling to them. And no matter what style you want, Brooklinen has a huge variety of different colors and patterns so that way you can mix and match and come up with the perfect bed for you. Their hardcore bundle, which is what I have, includes not only the sheets and two pillowcases, but two extra pillowcases and a duvet cover. And you can do three different colors or patterns for those. And right now, again, they are offering my viewers a special discount of $20 off any order over $100 if you just click the link below and use the code Rudolph. Because doesn't everyone want to look this comfortable? Thanks again to Brooklinen for sponsoring this week's video. We all know how much I love a 
good quality textile. And that is specifically what I'm trying to make the best use out of with the style of cape that I have chosen to go with. You see, I, again, didn't want something really large, didn't want something really impractical. I wanted something that, much like the rest of my wardrobe, can do multiple things. And I kept coming across this style in the early 20th century, wasn't specific to one decade or another, just showed up everywhere, that looked like it was a separate piece that sort of curves down around the neck and falls open in the front, and the front section is filled in by a variety of different closures. I thought this was a terribly interesting idea because that means even if they are stitched together in some of these examples, it would not be difficult to make this a two-piece situation where the front panel can be one thing, the cape can be another, and they can fasten through whatever means I want. You could do hooks and eyes or snaps, anything that you're willing to have visible on the piece that goes underneath, or you could even do it with very large brooches. If you say wanted to attach one of these styles of capes to a pre-existing garment that you don't want to leave permanent pieces on. You just have to make sure that the brooches aren't likely to damage it. But this also seemed like the perfect way to make something for, say, a cosplay or Halloween costume, and then turn it into something you can wear every day, instead of using really large yardage for a cape that you only have for this one costume. So this opened up a world of possibilities for styles and ideas. I realized what I really wanted to do was to make a fairly basic cape portion, but to have at least two different fronts. I also realized in the styles of fronts that I wanted, one of which would be buttoned up with a higher collar, something a little bit warmer, keep out the rain, and the other one would be a little more open and perhaps a little bit more stylish in its appearance. These seemed like great fronts, but that also means that I can wear them underneath some of my suit jackets as sort of a false waistcoat front. I could also even make them as a full waistcoat. This is something that you could make as a bodice, jacket, vest, whatever you want to go underneath, which also means that you can use any pattern you already have from any sort of bodice. So if you have a wrap front style dress you really love, use that. You just don't need to add all the sleeves and the other parts. You just need the basics to it. And this seems absolutely brilliant because you can make all of the pieces to match out of the same material or you could do them in coordinating colors you could have an entire color scheme of beautiful fall tones and they all mix and match together with all these different colors so i got really excited over this idea because the possibilities just seem absolutely infinite so i wanted to share how i'm doing this with you now i'm going to actually be making an unusual shape of cloak which is a square rectangular shape I am basing it off of this fashion plate as my starting place for inspiration with some of the styles and color blocking. But for both this and for a more typical cape shape, one that is circular but actually has darts over the shoulders, seems to be pretty popular in the early 20th century for a style uh, that will shape it over. I'm going to be putting patterns, digital patterns for both of these up on my Patreon page. They are going out to my Patreons first, but if you're willing to wait just a little bit, I'm also going to release them publicly shortly after that, so that way everyone gets advantage of these. It's just going to be the basic cape shapes, and then you fill in whatever fronts you want and you fasten it to them in whatever way that you want. So I am trying, again, as hard as I can, to bring back the cape, because it is such a useful and glorious garment, and I really wish that we had more of them out there. So with this information in mind, Let's get started on coming up with the exact designs that I want to make. First things first, I have the cape portion to figure out. I know that I want a rectangular shape and that the top will have to be curved to fit around my neck. As for the decoration, it will just be on the interior portion. So starting off with figuring out what size of rectangle and what type of curve I need. I'm just taking the fabric full and laying it over my body. I'm not going to be attaching the cape permanently to this jacket. I just wanted a jacket to give me a reference point of how low to go to get to the waist, what sort of bulk there'd be in the collar area, something to pin to that was pretty stable. So I pinned down in front where I wanted it, marked center back and the height of the neckline, and then marked the neckline on the side as well. So that way that gives me the front points and around the neck, and we'll draw that out later. I also marked where I wanted it, which was basically just below the butt. <laughs> 
So then that gave me a solid angle with a little bit of curve to get around the neck there and marked across a little further, including some seam allowance to make sure that it was wide enough and long enough. And I have a pretty good version here. However, the neckline got a little too big. It stretched. It's on an angle. So I added some tailor tape, which does not stretch, to the neckline, pinned it on, and it worked pretty well. If it was still too much of a problem, I also tried adding darts over the shoulders, which did help, but I didn't think it made enough of a difference with the wool that I had. But if your fabric doesn't really gather in well with the tailor tape or really is prone to stretching, darts over the shoulder can help as well. So then I got to stitching. I started with the border. I didn't want to measure things out and have it be a quarter of an inch off, so I just did one side and then pinned the long lower border into place. Worked my way across to make sure that it didn't stretch and laid flat along with the main body, and then I got down to the other end and figured out where the angle needed to be cut. I'm mitering these corners because that's the way that I prefer to do it. You can seam straight across, but this I think looks better. So I'm using the angle that I already cut, which I know is correct, from the other piece. I'm just laying that on top. The angle needs to go out because the seam will get bigger as we go. I made sure to line up where all the points of the seam allowance were, not where the edges were, and then cut that piece off stitched that seam and got to sewing the border on around all of the edges. I did leave it uh, uncut at the top until the very end to make sure that it fit correctly. Then I had to figure out where I wanted the soutache braid. Started off about half an inch, it wasn't enough, moved it out to an inch, Then I couldn't decide if I wanted it to corner and go straight across, or if I wanted to do something a little closer to the original where the uh, soutache crisscrosses at the edge. So I played around with a couple different options and decided I liked that version better, finished off the corner really nicely. So I drew a chalk line one inch from the edge and then I actually used a invisible zipper foot to stitch the soutache down because it's sort of humped on two different sides and comes down in the middle so it kept it really straight. In order to finish off the ends of the soutache, I cut them inch or so longer than where they will need to stop the seam, put a really big needle that I could put the soutache through into the seam between the stitches and pulled the soutache literally between the stitches so that way it disappears into the inside. And you can tack it down or zigzag it in whatever way you feel like you need to finish it off. I just left them as is. Then I added the tailor's tape, making sure that it butted up against that half inch seam allowance mark to the neckline of the exterior. I chose to do this because that made more sense to me. That's where I already had it pinned and I was sure that it was eased up the correct way. So I eased around the neckline a little bit, eased over the shoulders a little bit where it was stretching to make sure that it fit a little bit more snugly. And then I laid the lining to the exterior, pinned it all together, and stitched around all of those edges. After the entire thing is complete, I left about four or five inch opening up at the neckline that needs to be slip stitched together, but I trimmed back corners and edges of the seam allowance as need be, flipped the whole thing, pressed it, and then did the slip stitching to finish off the top of the neckline. So the final part is pretty crisp and clean. All those straight edges make it thankfully pretty easy to manage. You'll see some finishing bits here that we'll add later. I then got to work on the front piece. I decided to go with a style pretty similar to the inspiration image again. The only differences here was probably going to be how things close in front. The original inspiration is an entire jacket. This is just a front. First thing I wanted to do was take care of the welted pockets. So I took a belt the right length, stitched both of the ends, flipped it and pressed it, and then pinned it in place up against the seam allowance of where the opening will be. We'll be stitching a box and so you don't want the seam allowance to extend further than that box, it needs to be inside of it. And then the pocketing itself is what you can actually chalk the box onto, so you stitch that perfectly. Then you stitch the box completely, so that way even the corners are done, every single bit gets finished. And from there, we can then go and start to cut and open up that little box. The important thing when cutting here is that we're going to do little V's at the end, and cut straight down the rest of the way, but we don't want to cut through the welt. We're only cutting through the pocketing and through the body. Once we have both ends V'd and the middle opened up, 
you can pull the pocketing through the hole and pull it to the wrong side and then we will take it over to the iron and press that opening nice and flat so we have a good open rectangle. The welt will kind of stick up when you do this and that's where you want it to go. It's going to cover up that opening once we've pressed it. So now it looks nice and clean and finished and our next job is to actually stitch the pocket itself inside closed. So we're going to fold this up in half matching tops to tops. If your bottom of the pocket goes further than your seam allowance, you need to shorten it a little bit. And what I like to do is lay it flat like that, then work from the top side and fold back the body as I'm going around. I find this much easier, that way I know the body is out of the way as I'm stitching the two sides of the pocketing together. And so you go around the two sides and along the top, and this makes the pocket one nice happy contained space. And then the last thing is to stitch the ends of the welt down. I was doing a really quick job for this, so I just top stitched. You can go and do them nicely by hand, but again, really simple construction for this one was the point. So there we have the finished welt pocket. We're ready to get started on all of those other parts. The blue fronts are done up separately where they have their lining attached along the front edge. So we'll go along the front, on the bottom where it's going to stick out. I trimmed that back to a quarter inch seam allowance because it ends up looking better once you've pressed it and also it's easier to get around those corners. And then I went ahead and stitched up the top of the center back where the neck area is on the two fronts and the two linings for the black fronts. So both of those are taken care of, pressed open, and then we're ready to start adding the collar. The collar was done just like the welt pocket where you just stitch the two ends, flip it and press it and then pin it into place, making sure that it is centered up and hasn't stretched around the neckline. And then I'm able to add the two blue fronts along that as well, stitch that down. I like to do the stitching for these about 3 8 of an inch in rather than the half inch seam allowance that everything else will be. That way I'm sure I'm getting everything stitched in and there won't be any visible stitches once everything is finished and turned. Once the collar is on, once the little extra fronts are on, we're able to add the lining, all of those bits kind of get sandwiched in between and I will stitch around all the edges with the exception of once again a four or five inch gap down at that side which will be pretty hidden and we'll slip stitch that later. I've stitched all the edges. I'm trimming them back but unevenly. So I'm actually leaving the black wool, the exterior, half an inch and everything else is getting trimmed down to a quarter inch so that way when I press it kind of gives a little bit of a softening. It's a pretty thick and chunky seam allowance for the quarter inch and it's gonna show through. So letting it have that one half inch to go over the edge really helps soften it when I press. And everything can be turned right side out, all the corners carefully trimmed and turned and I can get started on fastenings. There are a lot of hooks and eyes on this and that's what I decided to go with. So I'm doing two hooks and eyes on the front of the blue and that will take care of the fastener there because it will have a belt around the bottom so I don't need to go all the way down the front. And then I'm going to be doing some hooks and eyes to fasten the cloak to the front piece as well. I ended up finding these little soutache pieces that are really adorable and there's going to be three on each shoulder and so this is where the hooks are actually going to be hidden rather than just directly onto the cape portion the hooks will be stitched to these soutache pieces. So first I am anchoring them really well to the cape portion, making sure to do that with a good heavy thread, and then I am anchoring the hooks to the other side of those little soutache pieces. I'm using a heavy silk thread for this so that way it is very sturdy. The eyes, or really the bars, will then be stitched to the vest in the correct place once I've tried everything on, make sure it matches up in the correct place. I also did put a hook and bar at the center back of the neckline as well because I found those two uh, sometimes kind of moved around a little. Last step here is to put the little ribbons down at the corners for where the belt is going to go through the cape. This is what will keep the corners down at the bottom. So I'm just using a small piece of grow grain ribbon folded over the ends and those ends then get whipped down. I'm not going through all the layers, just the blue layer so that way you don't see it on the exterior and the belt will go through that. Now I did not get to doing a second front for this trip, I just ran out of time, but I'm definitely going to do one in the future as I have more fabric, but I can still use all these pieces like the belt and that waistcoat style front separately along with my suits and dresses. 